Hi guys, you're welcome. Thanks for clicking. My name is Bukumi. So all Muslims need to know this. Let's check it out. Have you ever witnessed the ruins of the city of Sodom, the location of one of God's greatest lessons for mankind? As we had said, there was a prophet known as Lut, and we had made mention of how he sent Lut alayhi salam to the people of Sodom or the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Another name that Allah Azza wa Jal describes or mentions Sodom as Al Mu'tafika. That place is on the borders of Jordan and Palestine now, which we have these days something called the Dead Sea. And Allah tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَإِنَّكُمْ لَتَمُرُّونَ عَلَيْهِمْ مُصْبِحِينَ وَبِاللَّيْلِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ You people pass them during the day and during the night. Don't you then have brains that this is the punishment Allah served those who engaged in this type of act? So that is one of the reasons why Allah left them there. If you Google the location of the city of Sodom, it will tell you that it is located on Mount Sodom at the southwestern end of the Dead Sea. But is this true? And do you know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the fact that they are still there. Allah says, these people of Lut alayhi salam, we have kept them we have kept their signs there for all of you to see who come after them. So today you go to the Dead Sea. Allah says we've kept it as that. You will see what happened to the people of Lut. Go there and have a peep. Allahu Akbar. This is Tel Al Hamam. Some archaeologists believe that this could be the ancient city of Sodom. The exact location of the ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah as mentioned in religious texts like the Bible and the Quran, remains a subject of debate and speculation among scholars and archaeologists until today. There is no definitive archaeological evidence pinpointing the precise location of these cities. Traditionally, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are believed to have been situated somewhere in the region of the Dead Sea. What makes you think that this could have been the city of Sodom? So the reason is simply because uh, the size of the city. The largest in the whole region. For the Bronze Age. So it was a big city then. Huh? It's a very big city. The dating of the destruction layer at Tal El Hammam corresponds to the time frame traditionally attributed to the biblical and Quranic narratives surrounding the fate of Sodom. It's close to streams and springs of water and surrounded by flat, fertile plains, as described in the biblical texts. And it lies on two trade routes, one running north to south and the other east to west. It's a pivotal position for strategic trading cities. This is, in fact, the largest continuously occupied Bronze Age city in the southern Levant. This gate complex is, is pretty impressive, probably one of the biggest gate complexes in the Bronze Age. Before any Christian starts accusing the Quran as copying the stories from the Bible, let us make clear that the Quran is also claiming to be a gospel. The definition of gospel is the good news from God. If you could accept that the Bible were divine words inspired by God, why then would the Quran automatically be disqualified just because it came later on? Islam does not claim that the Quran is the words of Prophet Muhammad, rather, it is the verbatim word of God that was intended for humanity through Muhammad. The stories of the prophets of old are the history of mankind, not some fictional works with exclusive copyrights. Why would it be impossible for the divine to retell the same history? But what is important for us to know is the precise point only comes to us from the people of the book and from the Hebrew scriptures. And our policy with that is la nusaddiq wa la nukadhib. We neither say it is false, nor do we say it is true. It is something, it may be true, it may not be true. It is not something that we are going to be questioned on the day of Qiyamah. We are not going to be questioned about that. We are going to be questioned about our own deeds. What are the lessons that you learned from the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam? There were many differences in the detail of the story of Lot from the Bible and the Quran, both of which is valuable as a historical account of the story of humanity. As we had said, there was a prophet known as Lut. He was a youngster at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam when Ibrahim alayhi salam was thrown into the fire. This young man 
he accepted the message of Ibrahim and he was the only one at the time. So Ibrahim alayhi salam went further up north later on and we had made mention of how he sent Lut alayhi salam to the people of Sadum or the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now Lut alayhi salam found his people to be very, very different, to be wrong, to be filthy. The word used in the Quran is filthy. And we read that verse this evening in Surah Al-Anbiya where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْقَرْيَةِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ تَعْمَلُ الْخَبَائِثِ We saved him from the people who used to engage in filth. They also engaged in what is known as قَطْعُ الطَّرِيقِ which means they were highwaymen in the sense that they used to waylay the traveler and block him and steal his property. Another thing, they had their clubs where they used to gather and engage in evil. All the time, they would encourage people in doing evil. So, so much evil. These were the people who were punished in the biggest way. They had three different punishments for one nation. Allah says, as that battle ensued, early morning, they had the awful cry. And it was so loud, it started shaking them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He instructed the angel Jibreel, who was one of them, to get back into his original form. So Jibreel alayhi salam came to his proper form. And with the tip of one of his wings, he dug under the entire community and he lifted them right up. And then he turned them upside down. And they dropped from there going straight down. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we turned them totally upside down, completely. Over the years, archaeologists examining the structure's ruins have found evidence of a sudden high temperature destructive event. For instance, pottery pieces that were melted on the outside but untouched inside. In this area, we found many, many storage jars. It's carbonized, of course, burned. And the entire city, everywhere we've excavated, we have this massive destruction debris. So whatever destroyed the city also burned everything inside of it. So something happened at a massive scale, turning everything into this pile of rubble. One moment, right around 1700 BC. And that's a good way to describe it. It's a pile of rubble. It is sort of a mixture, a tumbling of everything. The destruction is absolutely the most violent kind of thing I've ever seen. We made the top the bottom and the bottom the top that's what allah says we did the tip of the wing of our angel jibril alayhi salatu wassalam wa amtarna alayhim hijaratan min sijil allah says and then we sent those stones which were baked rock like stones each one had the name of an individual engraved on it allah says musawwamatan inda rabbik they were already named each one had something engraved on it from allah this one for that man, this one for that man. And Allah says, it came in an arranged manner. The stones began to come from the sky. When one hit one, the other was looking and suddenly another started following this one and it hit him and the third was looking. So the third one hit the third and the fourth and the fifth until in a very, very short time, the entire community was totally destroyed. There was also one of these for the wife of Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. Steve's colleague, Phil Sylvia, has an intriguing new theory. This is a piece of mud brick, and this was exposed to heat, and it was so hot, the pottery itself has actually been melted into glass. Something flash burned this exactly. material exactly. to a temperature hotter than the sun. Hotter than the sun. By more than a factor of four. There are only two sources that can generate that kind of temperature profile that we know of. One, of course, would be an atomic bomb. The other one is either a meteoritic impact event or an airburst event. I think this was a meteor blast. I'm personally convinced of that. A new paper, published in the journal Nature Scientific Reports, examined possible causes of the devastation based on the archaeological record. They concluded that warfare, a fire, a volcanic eruption, or an earthquake were very much unlikely, as these events couldn't have produced heat intense enough to cause the melting recorded at the site. The study's co-author, Christopher R. Moore, an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina, explains that the air temperatures rapidly rose above 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit, clothing and wood immediately burst into flames. Swords, spears, mud bricks and pottery began to melt. Almost immediately, the entire city was on fire. None of the 8,000 people or any animals within the city survived. 
Their bodies were torn apart and their bones blasted into small fragments. The researchers then could only conclude that the only logical cause is a meteoric impact or an atomic bomb. But there is an immediate problem. They failed to find any crater anywhere nearby. Instead, looking at it from drone mapping, the site seems to be dotted with small craters like the surface of the moon, which perfectly aligns with the claim of the Quran of small burning stones instead of a large singular impact. We've been looking at the site for, for a dec over a decade, but looking at this image, and it's the first time I've thought of this, but it, it looks like an impact crater. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it, I was thinking as you were, as you were moving yeah, in on yeah. it, it looks like you're on the moon. There is clearly still ongoing debate and skepticism regarding the connection between Tal El Hammam and the city of Sodom. But the reality is, there is no incentive for the governments today who are pushing for the very same problematic secular values to promote this grim story of divine punishment. As everyday Muslims, we must heed the lessons of the past, lest we are doomed to repeat them. So, um, this is a story about Sodom and, Go uh, and Gomorrah. It's in the Bible and it's also in the Quran, in which, you know, they did a lot of things that was not acceptable in the sight of God. You know, they lived a wayward life and, you know, you, we all know the story. So, yeah, it's just, uh, Mr. Mek is just trying to let us know that we should not focus on all those negative parts in the Quran or the Bible. Whether it exists or it does not exist, God said it, it exists in the Dead Sea. Whether it exists or not, does not matter. What matters is you learning the good parts of the word, of the Quran per se. You need to learn the good parts and, you know, and also you have to learn from the Sodom and Gomorrah in a, in a way that you should not fall, that, you should not fall victim of what they did. You should not do the same thing or you should not imbibe the events that happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. That we should do the right thing we should behave well and we should serve God diligently. So he's just trying to let us understand the history of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's also in the Quran, the similarities between in the Quran and the Bible. And, and the commentator, he explained it better to us. That was an interesting one. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.